continue our series in the Beatitudes, in the Sermon on the Mount. This is what has been coined as the greatest sermon ever preached by the greatest preacher who ever lived, Jesus Christ. And what Beatitudes are, they are pronouncements of divine blessings upon the children of God who are herein being described in these various attitudes and characteristics. And this morning we come to the final Beatitude, which is perhaps the most bizarre of all the Beatitudes and should really stir us up this morning to ask some very serious questions about why Jesus would say what he said. Let's look at it together beginning in verse number 10. Blessed, and again, this is makarios. This is a pronouncement of divine blessing, joy, happiness, and peace are for those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice in verse 12 and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. God had a blessing this morning to the reading and the proclamation of his word. In the year 1900, in the great Boxer Rebellion in China, a group of insurgents had overtaken and surrounded a Christian mission station. And they blocked all of the pathways out of this mission station with the exception of one. And this pathway led out, and it led out to a main road. And these insurgents have surrounded this Christian mission. And they've got the one pathway leading out. And they made a cross. And they laid the cross down flat on this one pathway out of the station. And then they sent word to the 100 students who were inside. If you will walk out the single path. And when you come to the cross that is laying on the ground. If you will stop on that cross, treading it under your feet as a declaration that you deny, despise, and have nothing to do with Jesus as your king, we will let you go free. But if you walk around the cross and refuse to tread the cross under your feet, you will immediately face a firing squad. Well, these are young people. And overcome with fear and seeing these vicious insurgents surrounding the mission station in one way out, the first seven students all did the same thing. They came out covered in fear and trembling, afraid for their lives, walked up to the cross with tears in their eyes and, and feeling like this was the only way they were going to live and survive. They stomped on the cross. The insurgents stepped out of the way and let them go free. The eighth person to come out of this mission station was a very young girl. And she walks out. She comes up. It's her turn. They're coming out one at a time. She walks up to the cross, fear and trembling, tears in her eyes, afraid for her life, just like the first seven. But she does something different. She bows down on a knee. And she just says, Lord, Give me strength to live in this moment for you. She stands up. She walks around the cross. The insurgents immediately grab her, set her in front of a firing squad, and they execute the young lady for her allegiance to Christ. Because of her courage and her bravery and her dedication to the Son of God, even in the, even in the face of losing her life, she set an example. 92 other students walking out of this mission statement walked up to the cross, bowed their knee, asked God to give them strength to live for Him. And in that one moment, walked around the cross and immediately faced a firing squad. While that story is filled with courage and bravery, it's also filled with violence and heartbreak. And I could add to that story countless stories 
this morning, not only from uh, over a uh, uh, hundred years ago, but for the entirety of human history. All of God's people who have ever loved Him, believed in Him, and followed after Him have faced persecution. And our specific history as New Testament Christians, folks, Christian history is painted not with the, 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 the broad brush of brushes and paint. It's not written with ink. It's written and painted with the blood of God's people. It is a history that resounds with the loud sounds of prison doors shutting and chains being placed on people and handcuffs on people's hands. It is a history that is painted with imprisonment. It's a history that's that's tainted with insults and hatred and loss and separation and ridicule and mockery. We are a people whose history is that of being persecuted. It has sometimes happened outside the church from the world. And sadly, wolves in sheep's clothing at times have crept in. People have tried to overtake the church and marry it to the state and persecute anybody that didn't bow before them. Christianity is a, is a religion of persecution. And it shouldn't surprise us at all, because in the Gospel of John, in the 16th chapter, in the 33rd verse, Jesus Christ said these words, as long as you are in the world, you will have tribulation. You will have trials. You will have hardships. You will have persecutions. In John 15, he said, know that the world hated me first, and now it hates you. He said, I've chosen you out of the world, and for that very reason, the world will now hate when the author of Hebrews surveyed the history of the people of faith, people who have put their trust and their faith in the Lord from Adam on, here's what he said. Women had to receive their dead in Hebrews 11, 35 through 37. They had to receive their people by the death and by resurrection. Many others were tortured. They didn't accept their release, but they trusted that they would obtain a better resurrection. Many others received scourgings. <coughs> experienced mockings, chains, and imprisonment. They were stoned to death. They were sawed in two. They were tempted. They were put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and ill-treated. The history of God's people is a history of persecution. Now, I don't know about anybody else here, but when I think about being blessed and being happy and exceedingly <coughs> glad and joyful... I don't think about getting shot. I don't think about going to jail. I don't think about being mocked and ridiculed and outcast and separated from others. I, I don't think about being treated poorly. And that's why these words are sort of shocking for Jesus this morning when he says, happy are the persecuted. Blessed are those who are persecuted. He says, <laughs> rejoice and be glad. In some translations it says exceedingly glad when you are persecuted. And so, as I poured over this text and prayer and study and so forth, I found myself asking some really deep questions about persecution, about my own life, the life of our church and the life of God's people in the world today. In generations past, and if the Lord delays His return, in generations to come. And I believe if we will open our hearts this morning to the ministry of the Holy Spirit as He speaks to us from the Word of God, I think we can learn some incredible things this morning about persecution and some of the reasons we go through some of the things we have to go through as Christians. So I'm going to pose three questions and then look to the Word for the answers. And the first question is this, what exactly is persecution? I mean, if we had to define this thing, what is this persecution that Jesus says, blessed are those who have been persecuted? What does it mean to be persecuted? What is it? Well, the oko is the term that Jesus uses here. And here's, what, here's the, the simplest understanding of the word. It means to be either pursued or to be driven away with anger, violence, hatred, and hostility. So persecution is what we call this thing when the world and world systems, when 
lost people or, or wolves in sheep's clothing, or when Satan and demonic forces, when anyone who is hostile to the Lord Jesus Christ, to his people, his church, his kingdom, his gospel, and his word, when anyone who is opposed for that comes after the Lord's people, after his church, after him, and after his word, we call that coming after persecution. And it comes in a whole lot of different ways. Some of you may have experienced persecution in the form of mockery and ridicule. Maybe not directly, but let me ask you this question. Uh, regarding insults, degradation, mockery, and ridicule, have any of you ever found yourself on social media reading one of the comments under some verse you've posted or something where someone immediately just feels the need to hop on there and tell you that you're a bigot and narrow-minded and you're an evil person and that the Christian religion is horrible? I mean, we experience things like that. We also experience sometimes things like family members and friends find out that we're Christians or that we hold to certain biblical truths and suddenly they don't have anything to do with us anymore and they're always making little snide comments, hurtful remarks. Have you ever noticed that when it comes to the entertainment business, that about the only time they talk about Jesus and Christianity and preachers and deacons and churches, how are we painted in motion pictures and movies and Songs are always in the worst light, right? We're always the, the worst of the crowd. They always paint us in the worst of ways. There have been a lot of shootings that have happened here recently. As a matter of fact, in our country right now, every 16 hours, there's a mass shooting. I was talking with, with Mike this past week, and we were discussing that there's been several churches that have experienced mass shootings in the last couple of weeks in our nation where people were senselessly and violently murdered in churches. But we don't hear anything about that, do we? Because we don't matter to the world we live in. You see, another form of persecution is silencing. Let's just make these Christians go away. Let's take them out of the public square. Let's not give them a platform to speak. Let's just make them be quiet and go away. We don't like them. So silencing, canceling is a way of persecution. Exclusion, separation. But I think we always need to be very careful when talking about persecution. Because at the end of the day, we are the most blessed people on planet Earth. Because we have the freedom and the liberty to gather here, to use uh, social media platforms and all these other ways to speak freely, to talk about the gospel, the grace of Christ, to preach, to gather, to assemble together. And folks, I gotta tell you, there are some places in our world today like China. Or there are believers there who would give anything in the world to be able to publicly assemble with other believers and sing how great is our God like we did this morning. But they can't because they will face the firing squad in the 21st century. There are believers in the Middle East this morning who would give anything in the world to be able to, to wear a, an Ithus fish on their t-shirt, but they would literally be buried up to their neck and their brains beat out with stones. In some extreme Muslim countries this morning, just for being a follower of Christ. There are places in our world today where if you're found with the Bible, you're going to jail. When I start thinking about that, I think, Lord, I thank you that I live where I live. But let us never use our liberty as a cloak for sin. Let us use it as an opportunity to take the gospel to the nations and to pray for those missionaries who are in the most dangerous places in the world this morning because violence, imprisonment, and death still awaits many Christians in our world today. Persecution is a very real thing. And will continue to be a very real thing until our Lord returns. Well, the second question I had is, well, why persecution? Why does the world hate us so much? Why do they want to see us silenced and left out? Why do they run from us when they see us coming? Why are they putting our brothers and sisters in jail and even putting them to death in other parts of the world. Well, for, well to answer that question, why persecution, I, I just wanted to throw in this little thing very quickly. 1 Peter 4.15 says, Make sure that none of you suffers persecution, is the context, that none of you suffers as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a troublesome meddler. Let those words resonate. When you see some of these guys who are a little bit wackadoodle, a little bit off their noggin a little bit, 
and they go to these hospitals that allow uh, what they think is ungodly or unbiblical things to occur, maybe abortion or something of that nature, and these crazy people strap bombs to themselves, or they go hide bombs in these clinics, and they kill a whole bunch of people, blowing these places up, and then they say, I was doing the Lord's work, and then when they get arrested, they say, I'm being persecuted for the kingdom. They're not being persecuted, they're being prosecuted for breaking the law. Peter, 1 Peter is a book about God's people in Asia Minor, modern day Turkey, being persecuted. And he says over and over in that epistle, don't ever be on the wrong side of things and call it persecution. In other words, don't go do evil to other people. When the world does evil to you, he says do not respond with evil. And then when you get in trouble for that, it's like, well, they're persecuting me now. He says don't be a troublemaker. Don't be a meddler. Don't be, don't be uh, in trouble with the world for those kinds of things. So where does real persecution come from? Real persecution comes when we do the right things. And we do it with a right heart. Look at what verse 10 says. Why are we persecuted? For the sake of righteousness. Look at verse 11. Because of me, Jesus said. Well, what does it mean to be persecuted for righteousness and because of Christ? I think Paul said it best to Timothy when he told young Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.12, Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So what he's saying there and what Jesus is saying here at the end of these Beatitudes is this. When the Christian is living a righteous life, when Christ is radiating from their life, when their words, their attitudes, their behaviors, their relationship, their home life, their work life, when people see Christ in them, the world then persecutes them. Well, again, why is that? In John chapter 3, Jesus is likened unto light. And it says light came into the world. And men, in verse 19, loved darkness more than they loved the light because their deeds were evil. So why are we persecuted? Here it is. How many of you have been laying in bed? And maybe you haven't fallen asleep yet, but you've been laying there in the dark for quite a while. And then your sweetheart comes in the room and flips the light on real quick to remind you that you've not finished your honeydew list or, you've not, you know, or you're in trouble for something you said and it's been remembered from three weeks ago. And you have the Some reason honey has come in and flipped the light on or he has come home like we men do and very insensitive at times and we just want to tell you about something we encountered and so we come in and flip the light on and there's old knucklehead standing there wanting to talk at 1 o'clock in the morning when you've been up with kids all day. But we've all been there, right? You've been in the dark. You've been there a while. And somebody, boom, bright light right in your face. What is your immediate reaction? Cover your eyes. Yell, turn the light off. Why? Because it hurts, right? It stings. It burns. It makes you uncomfortable. And all you want to do is make the light go away. That is exactly why the world persecutes us. Because the world, apart from Christ, is living in darkness. And when the Christian shows up and the light of the Lord Jesus is radiating from us, it stings the eyes of the unbeliever. It's like flipping on the light in the middle of darkness. When we talk about things like relationships and marriage, why does the world get so angry? Because when the Christian shows up with a message and a lifestyle of purity, it's like suddenly, bang, turning the floodlight on in the face of impure darkness. When the Christian shows up and shows love and mercy, it's like shining a great big light on everyone in the world who is filled with hatred and is unmerciful. When the Christian shows up and we show kindness, it exposes everyone who's cruel. When we show up and we talk about generosity and we give and we're generous people, it exposes everyone who is selfish and greedy and covetous. When 
when we show up and we speak the truth, it's like a light that begins to expose everything that is false and untrue. And just like you and I, when someone flips the light on and we've been laying in the dark for quite a while, the world sees the light of the gospel of the grace of Christ. They see the light of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. They see and hear the light of the truth of God's word. And they say, turn that off. Get that off. Get that line out of here. And they want to do whatever they can to turn the line off. And sadly, in the history of Christianity, sometimes that has meant even the murdering of Christians and men still happens in our world today. So that's why the world persecutes. Well, I had a third question, and it's a big one. Why in the world does Jesus say we should rejoice in persecution? That when people are, notice what he says, when they're insulting you and persecuting you, you're blessed. When, they, when they're lying and, and making up things about you, or he says, when they're, when they're saying all manner of evil against you because of me, rejoice and be exceedingly glad. I don't, re there's not really something deep within me that goes, all right, let's get shot today for Jesus. <laughs> I'm more like, let's bring a soul for Jesus. <laughs> Blessing to somebody for Jesus. I don't really want to be beat for Jesus. And yet, we read the words of the greatest missionary who ever lived, who writing to the church at Galatia, says, let nobody trouble me because I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus and what the Apostle Paul meant was literal marks and scars. For he had been stoned and left for dead and beaten and scourged and, and, and mocked and, and had gone through such horrible things, had been robbed and had, had had to live at times without food and drink and shelter in the wild, running for his life from evil people persecuting him in the church. So I don't really... Think about rejoicing when I think about persecution. But snuggled into this beatitude, Jesus actually gives us three reasons that we can rejoice in persecution. And these helped me a lot, and I pray that they'll help you. And I'm going to kind of work backwards this morning. If you look down in verse number 12, he says we can, we can have exceeding joy in the midst of persecution because it puts us in excellence of company. We're an excellent company. Notice what he says the, down in verse 12. In the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. All around the world, the Lord's people suffer persecution, and it has been that way since the dawn of time. Adam and Eve, when they were kicked out of the garden, and sin entered into the world, and the serpent entered into the world, and evil and wickedness were in the world. You got two kids, Cain and Abel. Abel is someone who believes in the Lord and serves the Lord and sacrifices to the Lord and lives for the Lord. He is a righteous man. And then you've got Cain, who does not follow the Lord, does not sacrifice as he should to the Lord, does not give his heart and life to the Lord, does not believe in the Lord as his Savior. And what happens? The Bible says an evil spirit enters into Cain and he murders his brother, his righteous brother. Jesus himself said the righteous blood of Abel still cries out from the world today. And when you read through the scriptures, you read about Moses, you read about the prophets, you, you're Elijah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the others. You read about David and some, and, and some of the righteous kings. And, and then you get to the New Testament, you read about Paul, you read about Peter, the evangelist, and you read about Jesus Christ, who told us at one point, the servant is not greater than his master. They hate me, they're going to hate you too. But when people mock us and make fun of us and exclude us and ridicule us and they cast us aside because we're Christians, we can stop and rejoice in that moment and say, you know what, we're a good company. And though they reject us now, the day is coming when we will be embraced by the nail star hands of King Jesus and welcomed into the kingdom of eternal glory where we will be with all of the saints throughout all the ages. And we will rejoice forever and ever. We're in good company when we're persecuted. So it's the excellence of company. But then he mentions also in verse number 12, the excess of reward. Your reward in heaven, he says, is great. And when I thought about this, I felt motivated to have more courage and more boldness 
for Christ and the gospel and to live out a faithful Christian life to be light and salt in the world. I felt more boldness because my heart was taken to heaven not off of the things of the world. Do you know this world, they may come in as they did to many of the believers in Asia Minor that Peter was writing to, I mentioned earlier in 1 Peter. They were, their homes were taken. Listen, this world may take your home, but you've got a mansion in heaven reserved in eternal glory that can never be taken away from you. This world may come and and they may take all of your wealth and all of your worldly goods, but you have riches untold for all eternity awaiting you in eternal glory that can never be taken away. This world may take your health. They may beat you or harm you in some way for the gospel. But someday we're going to see Christ as he is and become as he is. And we have an eternal glorified body awaiting us that never again feels pain, that never gets sick, that never has a broken heart, that never knows sorrow or tears, and never knows sin again and will live forever in eternal perfection. And this world may take your life, but they can't take the eternal life that is a gift from God through Jesus Christ. Our Lord, and things might get rough here in this little life that is but a vapor. But thank God, a million years from now. I mean, what, what's the, the old hymn saying? When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. No matter what we go through here, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for his people in eternity. So life might get a little rough sometimes living for Christ in this world, but thank God nothing in this world compares to the world that is to come. The new Eden, the new garden, the new mountain, the new heavens, the new earth, the new Jerusalem, whatever you want to call it, thank God for the excess of eternal reward that awaits God's people there. But there's one other reason that gives us to rejoice in persecution. Not only because of the excellence of company that we enter into, and not only because of the excess of reward that he has for his children who are persecuted, but because it's evidence of salvation. It's evidence of salvation. Notice what he says in verse number 10. Those who are persecuted, they're blessed because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now remember, he is not giving us these beatitudes as these these laws that we must obey in order to receive heaven, he is saying these are the people who are on their way to heaven, who have truly been born again by the Holy Spirit, who are true followers of Christ. And the evidence in this week's beatitude is that they face persecution. Verse 10, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In 1 Peter 4, 14, it says, If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed. Because the spirit of glory and the spirit of God is resting on you. Dwayne was teaching here on a Sunday evening. It's been a few years ago. And he talked about an event they did one night in Moorhead. And teaching on this subject. With a youth group that he was working with. They brought in the young people and they, they had one kid who was going to be a prosecutor and the other kid's going to be a defense attorney and, and they had a judge and they had they brought this girl up and, 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 and they're acting all this out for the youth group to try to make a point. And what they did is they brought this young girl up and they put her on trial to see if they could convict her of being a Christian. Was there evidence in her everyday life that she was a follower of Christ? And so they, they looked for, first of all, the evidence that she loved God. Do you love the Lord? Do you serve Him? Do you love Him? Do you worship Him? Do you praise Him? Do you brag on Him? Do you share about Him? Do you have a desire in your heart, even though your life is imperfect? Is there a desire in your heart to just live close to Him? Is there evidence that you love God? And then they ask the question, is there evidence that you love His people? Is there evidence that you encourage and edify and help and, and are generous to and are charitable towards and love and pray for and invest in other Christians? And then they ask, where's your evidence for a hurting and a suffering world? For people who are engulfed in drug addiction and alcoholism and, or they're homeless or because when Christ came into this world, he looked at the hurting masses and he brought love and ministry and grace and kindness and peace in the gospel to them all. So there was the question, let, let's look at your life and see if we see Christ's likeness regarding hurting people. 
And then where's the evidence of your love for the lost? Do you ever tell anybody else about Jesus? Do you ever invite anybody else to come and hear about Jesus? What do you do to display Jesus in your life? Well, Jesus says one way we can put our own life on trial, one way we can examine our own life is to say this. When I look at this lost world without Christ living in sin, is there evidence that I am different from them? And if there is, if you haven't, at some point, you're going to face persecution. But you can rejoice in that moment because it is a reminder. Thank God others see Jesus in me. Even though they respond negatively, guess what? There's going to be people that respond positively. There are going to be people that, that reject the Christ that you live for and serve and proclaim. But there will be people that God will use Christ in you, the hope of glory. He will use the, the fruits of the Holy Spirit in your life. He will use the good news of the cross and resurrection when you share it. God will use that to prick the hearts of unbelievers, to convict them of their sin, and to convince them that Jesus is the way of salvation. So even though sometimes re people reject and ridicule and mock and they hung, just rejoice and say, at least they're hearing about Jesus and seeing Jesus in me. And thank God he might use me to reach somebody else. So I guess the question before us today is, could we be found guilty of being a witness for Christ? Could our life, if we were put on trial, would our life show forth the life of someone who lives for Christ, who proclaims Christ, who the love of Christ is seen in generosity and kindness and patience and goodness and godliness and even in a declaration of what is true according to Christ, could we be found guilty in a court of law being God's people? I know I think everybody here today, and I would say this, and I actually bragged on our church recently to somebody, I think we could get some guilty verdicts. Thank God for my church family. Amen. People who are not ashamed of Christ, people who love the Lord, but also love the lost. Amen. And don't see them as enemies, but as our mission field. And they may get angry and want the light turned off every now and then, but just keep shining the light of love. Keep shining the light of love, and God will use it. Let's bow together this morning as we begin to think about life decisions. What life decision we may need to make today. Maybe you're here and you've never known Christ or you're listening and, uh, through the radio or, or watching this later through social media, however you may do it. And you've been convicted in your heart that you're a sinner living in darkness. And you long for the grace of salvation. Well, we've got wonderful news. Jesus Christ came to save sinners. That's who he came for. Those who are lost in sin and need to be saved. And he was so very clear that if you would believe on him, he would give to you the free and gracious gift of everlasting life. Your sins would be forgiven as they are engulfed in the blood of his cross where he died for our sins. That you will have the gift of eternal life. You will be born again now, made a new creation right here, right now by the power of the Holy Spirit, filled and sealed with the power of the Holy Spirit. And someday, you will be raised up just as He was raised from the dead. And all you have to do to receive the great gift of salvation is believe on His name. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Sometimes we just need a point of reference that we can look back to and say, this is the day where I turned to Christ and believed in Him. If you need that point of reference, then in your heart right now, just say, Lord, I confess and I acknowledge that I'm a sinner and I cannot save myself. So today, I believe that Jesus died for my sins. I believe that you accepted what He did and you raised Him from the dead so that where He is, I can be also. Today, I give my life fully to Christ. I know I can never be perfect. So today I choose to trust in the one who is perfect for me, Jesus, my Savior and my Lord. I pray 
that you have made that decision for Christ today. And if you have, I want you to come and let me know before you leave here today. And I'd love to put some resources in your hands and talk to you about your next steps in following Christ. But maybe you're here today and you're a Christian. Let's talk life decision for you. Is there some sin in your life that you feel is crippling you? Maybe you're here today and, and as you've heard the word or as worship has gone, or even now as you're hearing my words, as you sit there with your head bowed and your heart is being drawn to the Lord, maybe you feel a deep conviction for some sin in your life that you think nobody but you knows about. And you hate that thing in your life and you want that thing gone out of your life. And it keeps you living in crippling shame and you just feel totally defeated like there's no freedom. Well, I came to let you know that Jesus Christ came to set the captives free. And no matter what you have done or how you have strayed, oh, he said he would leave 99 of his sheep to go get one of his beloved ones who goes astray so that he will lose none of them. He gives us a promise in 1 John for the Christian. If you will just confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. So whatever burden of sin you're carrying today, maybe that's your life decision. You need to give that thing to Him, to cry out to Him, to pray to Him, to ask Him to forgive you, and to begin seeking wise counsel of how you can know freedom from that thing. If you want someone to pray with you today, I'd love to pray with you. If you need to talk about it or maybe uh, just get it out in the open and in confidence, you come to me. We'll set a time and we can talk. Let's walk in the freedom and the victory that Christ won for us at the cross when he conquered the world, the flesh, and the devil. It has no right in your life, and there's freedom in Christ. Would you come find that freedom today? Maybe you're here and you're a believer. There's a decision you've been needing to make. The Lord's been convicting you. Maybe you've never been baptized, and you need to do that. Uh, maybe, maybe you believe this is where God has brought you, and you want to be a part of our church, and you want to... Become a member of our church. Look, if the Lord lets you in his church, we'll let you in this one. We just we will just welcome you with open arms. You're probably already, we consider you family anyhow. We're just a bunch of misfits that Jesus saved. And we'd love to have you part of us. 